Let's start. All right. Hi, everyone. This is Kurt Barone. And Brad Pinsky. And we kind of caught ourselves a little off guard here by clicking the button before we were ready. But here we are for another edition of File or Roundup for what is April it? 1st. April first. April first. Yeah, and and can I start as we as we start our show? I really I want to congratulate Kurt uh, and myself. Uh, we're going to be ending the show uh, just so everybody knows because we have been appointed as the uh, chief uh, the chief of the U.S. Fire Service. Uh, Kurt is now in charge, and he has selected me as his deputy chief for the U.S. Fire Service. So we're very excited on this April Fool's Day to be making that announcement. Okay, anyway, so All I had right. to do something uh, for the holidays. There you go. I had to do something. I, I kind of figured you had something up your sleeve here. Yeah. But um, let's let's start with the first, uh, first case, at least on the blog for this week. And it's a case out of California. Um, let me kind of get it up here so I can kind of go through the facts. But it's a, it's a settlement of, a, of another sexual harassment case uh, that we see in the fire service. And I want to talk about it just a little bit. It's a $535,000 settlement. Um, got a copy of a pretty comprehensive article that I, I think does a good job of presenting both sides of this case. And I think it's representative of what I want to study if I have the opportunity, which hopefully I will through my my studies at Arizona State, that um, we can study uh, and get a better understanding of um, the different sides that are contributing to these types of litigation. But the bottom line is we have a female firefighter alleges she was discriminated against, a litany of uh, ways that she was treated. She was ostracized. Uh, she was unfairly uh, disciplined. Uh, people started rumors about her and all the kind of things that we see typically. So that's sort of one side of it. The other side of it was that she was generally perceived from the firefighter's perspective as being lazy and unreliable, not showing up for shifts and, and different things. Um, and, you know, what, you know, which version of the events is, is accurate uh, are, are either or of them both. accurate right or is the truth somewhere in the middle and the reason i say that is i and and i i love the fact that people read our stuff and share it okay i i think that's phenomenal but there's a lot of confirmation bias in that when folks do that and what they do is they say here's another if if they're of the perspective that every woman who claims to have been sexually harassed is the victim of uh male hostility toward women uh they're going to say oh here's another example and then uh, you know, other people take it in the other direction. And where's the truth? Um, and that's that's what I want to study. What percentage of these cases um, are, do we have a difficult person, a difficult uh, firefighter who's having a tough time getting along with other people? And it w doesn't matter whether it's a fire department that they're working in or UPS or Coca-Cola, wherever they're working, difficult personality, they're going to be a problem employee, and they just happen to be in the fire service. And peer pressure and some of the other group dynamics get applied to them, trying to get them to conform to the group norms, and it doesn't work, and they're in a protected class, and they, they're going to say that that's why. When we have a white male, what do they do? They say, I was a whistleblower, I reported something to OSHA, I did this, or I'm subject to a hostile work environment, okay? So, what percentage of the cases are that? And I have no idea in this particular case, okay? But what percentage of the cases are that versus do we have someone who is being subjected to someone who is truly uh, an abusive person and is um, taking advantage of them and, and, and um, truly discriminating against them for unjust reasons, okay? And there's all sorts of prejudice that can cause people to see things one way. We joke, you and I, I'm a Red Sox fan, you're a Yankee fan, you see a close play one way, I see it a different way, okay? Right. But the same thing plays out in the firehouse where somebody says something, and if they're on the Yankees, you're going to see it one way, and I'm going to see it a different way. Yeah, you so. know, and I, I do think it would be a phenomenal study. I will tell you, if I study my week, right? Because I have three cases right now. And to your point, all three cases are identical. Now, two, I'm on one side, one, I'm on the other, but they're all identical. They all involve an individual who clearly in all three cases does not get along with anybody uh, in, let's call it the service. And whether it's ambulance or fire, it doesn't matter in this case. Mm -hmm. And 
the members of the fire department, the first thing they do, or the ambulance or whatever, but they all say, I don't want to work a shift with this person. Now, that's easier to do in like a private entity, like an ambulance corps. It's harder to do in a fire department, right? Mm -hmm. So, but the first thing I usually see is we don't want to work with that individual. And that individual says, oh, no one's working, wants to work with me. They're retaliating. And I question, I don't think that's retaliation, right? You brought it upon yourselves. People don't like you. They don't sign up for a shift with you. Or sometimes in volunteer organizations, you see nobody will show up when I'm here or they won't vote for me. But on the paid side, the firefighters are normally forced to work with that individual, right? They 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 can't just change their shift. Like somebody who says, well, I'm not going to work that shift on an ambulance side um, or, you know, private side. So mm -hmm. what I see and seeing in now two of these three cases, the firefighters resort to what they call some in-house corrective action, where they are going to take it amongst themselves to cause the individual to come back into line with the good of the order, the good of the group, and to stop being uh, such a toxic, for lack of better words, individual. And so they have this in-house justice where they're going to challenge the person, and I'm quoting some stupid language they've used, but challenge the person by, you know, to become more of the team. And anyway, so, and you could see what happens, right? So now you get, well, retaliation, not retaliation. And now I'm going to find something I did rather than saying, because I'm caustic, rather than saying, because I badmouth everybody and everybody hates me, or I pick on everybody, or I think I'm, but whatever the reason well, nobody is. Nobody can admit to that. No, nobody's nobody. going to admit to that. So of course, right. So they come up with well, remember on this day, I complained about something or you're just doing this because of me or right. They're, they're going to fill in a reason. And now we have the hard time looking back. Well, I made a complaint on this day. Mm -hmm. I did this on this day, right? I could see exactly what you're saying play out in the cases I continuously handle in the fire service. Yeah, and and our, our job as a lawyer isn't to sort that out. Our job is to zealously represent the side that we're representing. And under, with the belief that if the other side has the equivalent, uh, comp, equivalently uh, competent attorney, that the truth is going to come out through that sort of um, uh, that that process of fighting it out in court. OK, right. which probably isn't good for everybody either. But there's really no alternative at that point. You have two different people with different worldviews about what happened. Yeah. Uh, and, so, you know, sometimes it's going to come down to the advocacy um, part of it and who's who's a better advocate, who's got better facts, who can make a, a better case. But um, again, uh, I, I think uh, my perspective is I'm coming at it not from that. Um, zealous representation aspect, but more from a clinical aspect of it. And where, what you just said is exactly what we're studying this week in my advanced social psychology class. Uh, and we're studying group dynamics. And one of the um, uh, formative parts of a group is that they establish norms and they socialize that. and they supervise, um, they, um, what do you call it? They uh, socialize uh, people that come into the group to to conform to the norms. Right. And some people do, most people do, some people don't. And if we we're dealing like one of the examples in the book was a, a group of people who play poker every week. And if you don't conform to the norms, then you don't get invited back. Okay. Right. Well, that's fine if your group is a poker group, but when you're dealing with the fire department, you don't have the ability to vote somebody off the island. Right. Okay. Right. This is not your, and same thing in your law firm. Okay. If you have norms in your law firm and people don't comply with the, the norms that you have, they're gone. But when right. you're in a fire department, you don't own the island, you don't own the right. law firm. And so you have like this superordinate um, set of norms Plus, you have the group norms in the in the in the smaller either station or uh, company level. So we've got all of this going on, and I just as as maybe because we're studying it this week, and the 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 case kind of uh, triggered that thinking in my mind. It, it primed me, I guess, and that's what we're it, we're trained to think but, about. But I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I I, I want to point in though. You know, you raised two perspectives, but there's a third perspective. You raised the two lawyers, but before yeah. we even get there, and what I always find missing, and I'm speaking to you, the fire chiefs, right? I fire chiefs, HR people. This is my advice to you, which is what I miss 
seeing are notes about an investigation or counseling. So for example, one of the most helpful notes that I never, rarely, if ever see, is a note from the chief met with this employee on, let's say, January 1st, 2024. And detail to ask employee, please detail all of the complaints you have, which are causing you to be unhappy. And then mm -hmm. something they signed. These are all the complaints I have. Right. What you'll be doing when you, right, is twofold. One, you're trying to help to show we tried to fix things, whether it resulted in counseling or not, or corrective action or not, or, but it's, it's at least you're talking to somebody who you know to be a problem as opposed to turning a blind eye to it. But mm -hmm. then by asking them, here's everything you told me that you're having trouble with, you're upset about, what will be missing from that list will be what will come up three or four months later and they're all harassing me or they're complaining, right? You didn't tell me that on January. So you're closing the door. And this is what I want to see, Chiefs. You're closing the door for, for that person to open up and say, but yeah, two months before that, I had all these problems. Well, you didn't tell me, so it looks manufactured. I, I asked you, I wrote it down, you signed it, and there's nothing here. So Chiefs, when you're faced with this, or captains, lieutenants in a big department, I suppose, when you mm -hmm. counsel someone and you ask that you're investigating what are your issues, right, where nobody wants to work with you or you're upset or whatever, put it in writing all of their reasons. And you at least, okay, nothing before this day is coming in that they're going to make up. That's that's what I would like to see before that, it ever gets to the lawyers. And, and we recommend that in uh, in the um, professional standards class that I teach as well. Like as soon as someone complains about something, it's it's not something that we necessarily want the fire chief dealing with. We want it assigned to someone to investigate. And one of the final questions when you're dealing with the complainant is, have we covered all of your complaints? And this should be done, especially when we're dealing with harassment or Always. these these types of things. It should be recorded. We should be yeah. doing recorded interviews so that there's no question later on. Did you misinterpret something? Did you omit something? Here's the recording. OK. Right. And have we adequately covered all of your allegations? OK. And can, can they say, oh, I forgot to say one? Yeah, you can say you forgot to say one. And and if they call us the next week and say, hey, you know, there was one more thing I wanted to add. That's fine. We'll take that. But matter of due diligence here, we want to make sure that we ask that particular question. And I, so. and I think, you know, it it also has the benefit of allaying some concerns. Nobody's listening to me. I don't have anyone to go to in, inside the department. So I'm going to go to the state or whoever. And right, at least the person sitting down and saying, what's the issue? What can I do? What can we, right? It, there is some benefit. And if, and if the person says, well, they're all picking on me, great. I will go deal with them, but also say, why are you picking on her? Right. And let's solve it. And it's not going to happen any longer. We're not going to have firehouse justice, but nonetheless, what's your issue? And, and then let's resolve it. But we can't turn blind eyes. I'm glad you're teaching that because that, that's, that's so critical. Absolutely. Um, okay. Want to head to Nashville? Sure. Sure. Let's uh, so Nashville's um, interesting for a, well, a, a reason, I guess, but in any event, so, Here's what happened. So all it's saying is a court is saying we're denying a motion to dismiss. So here's what's coming up. We have a lawsuit which is filed by a deputy fire marshal uh, of the National Fire Department. And the individual, a female, claims that she was passed over for a promotion uh, to the fire marshal. And she blames that on uh, discrimination based on age and gender. So the... Um, department now seeks to get out of it saying, listen, there's a 300 day, and there is, everyone should know, there's a 300 day time frame that you have to sue within after the alleged allegations happen. Now, I have to tell you what I'm about to say. I was shocked. This is not how I thought this would come out, which is why I presume you put it. The So the city says, listen, in the plaintiff's complaint, the lawsuit, it says when things happen, the date of the incident, so this the fire department says, well, based on that date in the complaint that the plaintiff said, and and I don't know. It's an if, admission, isn't it? That's an well, admission. Well, that's what I was about to say. I don't know if it's a verified complaint or not. If it's a verified complaint, 
then, right? And I'm guessing that it was not a verified complaint, but I didn't search for, for the word verified. Um, mm -hmm. In federal court, I think they have to be verified, but that would go to our friendship Comstock. So um, nonetheless, if it's not verified, I get it, right? It's just allegations in the complaint and that's not as an affidavit. The problem, your problem is as a, so anyway, so the court says, listen, fire department, you can't rely on a statement made in the complaint. And I'm thinking unless it's verified, I don't know, but um, because it's just an allegation and that doesn't affirmatively establish the date something happened. But here's the really interesting thing. So now the fire department, they could refile the motion if they wanted, but how would they do that? They would it, have to say on this date. They'd have to have an affidavit, right? That yeah. And what do you get an affidavit from? I didn't harass her on this date or I did <laughs> retaliate on this date or this was the date. Now, the, oh. the funny thing is, though, it would be the date's obvious. I don't know why they didn't do this. The yeah. date is the date the decision was made or announced or at the latest she became aware of, right? The department's decision not to promote her. It can't be any later than that date. I, so I don't know why they need to rely on the complaint anyway, unless, unless my guess, and I didn't read the whole thing and uh, the whole decision, my guess is um, they don't like the date the actual date. So they tried to go back of the decision when they didn't hire, maybe they go back to an earlier date that they claimed. I'm guessing. But. I, I have no idea because I, I couldn't figure it out either. And, uh, you know, when I put this in, I, I was thinking, you know, the average firefighter is going to read this and roll their eyes and say, oh, this is a boring case about procedure. And it doesn't really, but really um, I want, I, yeah, but I, I did, I thought it was interesting from a legal perspective, but, um, I want to get a uh, a good sense of the types of lawsuits that we're seeing out there. And this is, again, if we get by the procedural issues here, we've got um, a female who um, appears to have been qualified. Now, we don't know about her aptitude, uh, but certainly experience wise, uh, she had been in the department. Uh, she was, I believe, 60. She was in her 60s. Um, so she was rather older and they ended up appointing someone who was in their 40s. Uh, into the position. Uh, but the, the bottom line is that we do see these, you know, combination age discrimination and gender discrimination claims when someone who seems to have the qualifications, at least on paper, uh, and then doesn't get the job and someone who has lesser qualifications. But again, what we don't know, much like what we talked about in the last case, is that really, uh, do we have someone whose personality is not well suited for the position? Is that really what's driving it? Or is there truly discrimination going on? And maybe there is truly discrimination. We don't know. But again, trying to, in the blog anyway, trying to get um, a good representative sample of the, the types of allegations, types of complaints uh, that are out there, as opposed to the specifics of this particular case being all that uh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, and, you know, and let's go back to the last case combined with this. So this is a little different, but right. Mm -hmm. But if you're the whoever's hiring, the chief, the HR department, the whatever, it yeah. seems to me to not hire if somebody is hired who is less qualified, less time on the job. Right. And you're hire and you're hiring a male over female or white over black or whatever. Mm -hmm. You better have something in the file that says we've had problems with this other, with this person, right? If you, come on, and, and everybody knows it, you know darn well you're hiring or not hiring this person when they apply. You know right. it, and you know it's coming up. Somebody announced a retirement, you know they're going to apply, you know it. So, and I'm not saying manufacture anything. That's that's not what I'm doing, but there better be something in the file that mm -hmm. you don't like how this person does their job or something, because if they've got all phenomenal ratings and reviews, you know, you got a problem, yeah. right? Because you have nothing to point to. And I, again, I'm not saying manufacture anything, but I'm just saying right. if there's nothing in the file and and you're just like, oh, we don't care. You know, let's let the person ride out their job despite you had complaints against them. Well, you waived your opportunity now, right? Mm -hmm. You could have put those complaints in the file, investigated, done whatever. But now you have you have no, you know, you have no way to defend your your choice of the other person. Yeah. Um, no, so it, 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 
It's a fair point. Uh, you know, and again, a lot of these, we're, we're looking at this from several thousand miles away. We don't know the personalities. We, we right. What we do know is the fire marshal's position is very important, particularly in a metro fire department. And in any fire department, it's an important position. But you're dealing with the public. You're dealing with elected officials. You're dealing with lawyers. Um, there's always the risk that, you know, if, you, if you're not making good decisions, you're going to create liability and problems for the department. So it's, a, it's an important a public facing position and you want to make the right choice here but you're right going past somebody who seems to be qualified seems to have more experience you want to make sure your ducks are in a row right and the time you know in both instances i guess my uh, the last case this case the time where you could make this look better is not later it's <laughs> earlier you yeah. have to fix the problem earlier by putting something in the record that's true by meeting with the person by gathering whatever it is if it got to the point and you you open the file and you have nothing well mm -hmm. that's either because there is nothing which in case why didn't you hire the person or because you just kept looking over you know overlooking things you didn't document the file that's on you mm -hmm. um but you know and and i think people are very concerned about their reviews and if your reviews are always stellar for that person and they didn't deserve them again that's on you yeah you know it's interesting i, I just kind of thinking about the, your approach to this um i went through i i served on an assessment uh committee that we did an assessment center for promotions uh in a, it was in a different state uh but it was run by a psychologist a guy with a phd and he did a lot of police department assessment centers and i think that if if you have someone like that that you can work with and develop an assessment center oh, yeah. you'll be able to pinpoint flaws in someone's personality if you have someone who is sort of in line for a position um you can set up an assessment center and it, it won't be necessarily the fire chief in this case the the suit is again the chief is named as a defendant here or at least is sort of at the at the center of the allegations here but it's going to be an assessment center where um the assessment center then is going to recommend the candidate and you you know if if you do feel like you've got somebody who ha is higher qualified but they just don't have the personality for the job um there, there are ways to do it um you know that are are going to avoid liability but you know uh -oh. And you points. I, I, we see a lot of cases where it's say points. And, you know, I, I like point totals if they're based on objective criteria. Well, when they're based on subjective criteria. Yeah, you um, don't want to be making up your own assessment center. Right, right. <laughs> okay, exactly. But you, when you have someone who has those kind of credentials. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you have a quick note on your blog, which is correct, that uh, OSHA has, as they should have, has extended the deadline to comment on the former fire brigade standards, the new uh, standards. But I, I do want to talk about this for a moment because, um, well, because of a lot of things. You know, I, I do a lot, as you, I do a lot of policies for departments, but I do a lot of policies for New York State departments. New York State is an OSHA state. So mm -hmm. everybody knows, is, should know, OSHA applies to private companies, but it also applies and does not normally apply to a municipality or a political subdivision. However, if your state is an OSHA state, then this applies. Um, even more so if you're a volunteer department. And, and this is a little bit concerning because OSHA relying on cases and their preamble to all these regs, we're in the just proposed regulation, they comment, well, if you're a volunteer that receives significant benefits. Now, we all know that's been the case, right? You'll be treated as an employee and you have to then comply if your organization has to comply. But- what is a significant benefit? And they list some things, but I was very nervous of the list. I got to tell you that the list, they say, well, death and disability benefits and insurance benefits. Uh, wait a minute. That's not really a benefit. I'm dead, right? So, uh, or severely injured. I don't know that I'd say that's a benefit that makes me an employee. That's a state law requirement, but they have some other things, length of service award programs or nominal payments. And some, so there's, there's always a balancing that we see. It's not black and white. In any event, here's the only comment I really want to make about this. Everybody relax because if you read that and you even commented like hours of your life wasted, 
If you read the first 60 or so pages of the proposed regs and their commentary, what the Department of Labor has said is, we want to know a lot. They must have said, we are soliciting comments on this. We want to know about that. And if I could find six hours of my life, I will submit comments because I have a lot of the information that they would want, you know, but they want to know how many departments are actually offering physicals. What are the physicals? What do they do with the physicals? Who gets them, right? And and they have some interesting proposals with regard to like 1582 regarding physicals. But everybody should relax. They have requested so much information First of all, this is not happening in 24. There, there, there's no way they're going to A, approve it, and B, release an effective date of in 24. So relax is one. Two, and I got to tell you, <laughs> if you were truly complying with the fire brigade standard, you would already be addressing a lot of this. If you were all, and this is what I've been lecturing on and must have policies at FDIC. This is what I've been doing. And Cause I looked, I said, wow, I wonder how the policies I've been doing will shape up with these. And I looked and look, if it wasn't mandatory, I said the department should not shall, right? It wasn't law. I said the best practice is should, but I got to tell you, I've been preaching for 15, 16 years, which is probably only half the time you have, but ways to comply with federal law. One example, I want to give one example, and people are going nuts about this. It's not new that what, what the government is going to put into regs, which is already in the regs, says every firefighter must have a evaluation of their skills every year, an actual hands-on demonstration proving proficiency and or competency. I'm a little unclear which one they're going for at the moment, but it's generally competency. Um, that's already required, but very few departments do an actual skill test. And it's if you are governed by OSHA in any way or right, either by agreement or otherwise, you must actually have everybody demonstrate that they can perform the essential skills, which would mean you have to have a list of the essential skill job requirements, which is going to be very important when we start getting to NFPA 1582 and talking about physicals. In any event, this is going to take you a year to comply easily. If you're not in compliance with anything, you're going to need a year to comply. But relax. You don't, we don't yet know what OSHA is going to come out with. They requested so much information, so many questions, so many, what would people think? How do people do? How many are doing this? If you read the preamble, you will see they're fishing for information, which is good. And I just don't think we're going to see, obviously they, they extended the step one, they extended the rulemaking comment period to uh, June 21st. My bet is they're going to take a half a year or more to review all the comments. And there's so much opposition to it. National Volunteer Fire Council, other things, IFCC, obviously, and, and IFFF in, in support of it. But um, just everyone needs to relax. And I, I say that because if you were in my office, and I'm not kidding, once an hour for the last three weeks, I get at least one phone call. Oh, my God, what do we do? And if when your line my policies, is busy, I, what, just so you know, when your line is busy, they're calling me. Yeah, because... I, I, and it is insane how worried people are. And look, I support most of this, but I'm not going to get so into the weeds other than to make comments to them. But I'm not going to get so into the weeds on this as to start advising clients. Here's what you need to do. We don't know yet. And there's going to be a lot of changes. Usually they, the federal, just so you know, usually the federal government agencies adopt almost exactly what they put out, but their comments are very specific. One commenter said this, and here's how we're adjusting, or we don't agree or whatever. They react. They're going to receive, and you can see all the comments online as they're posted and who posted them. There's going to be hundreds of th and thousands of comments, and it, it's not going to happen so quickly. Yeah. But my suggestion for everybody, because I Seemingly, everyone's saying this. Well, what should we do now? My answer, truthfully, is two things, minimum two things. Let's get our physical standards up, our physical requirements, our, our how physicals are done, all of that. 
And we should do, uh, Kurt, we should do a uh, maybe a paid seminar on physicals and disability discrimination and all that. I'm giving one at our conference this week, which we'll see what. Um, but that that's number one. Get your physicals in order. And if you're... If your physical, which most of you would probably is, is, oh, we just send them to the doctor and let the doctor decide, you're you're wrong. Don't do that. We need to talk. But that's not what you want. But um, so let one, get your physicals in order if you want to focus. And two, your training. You've got to implement testing of the essential functions of the job, which mean, and these are the same things, you need to uh, set out in paper all of the skills the firefighter must complete to be just a basic firefighter. Those same skills will be used as a job performance requirement with very little modification on the physical side. That one task is what I'm suggesting for everyone. Start outlining the essential skills that your department needs, not a normal firefighter that you, some may draft, some may not. Some may have high rises, some may not. Start there and then you will be prepared to deal with many of the regulations that are inevitably going to come out. But don't panic. You got time. You will have time. This isn't going to be overnight. It's approved. And then tomorrow, the knock on the door, let me see you're compliant. It is not going to happen that way. Just relax. I'm betting they're going to give departments minimum of 90 because they have to, but maybe six months a year to start getting into compliance. And then the inspectors aren't going to be ready to inspect anything for a very long time. They've got to be trained. They got to have new checklists. Relax, relax. And Kurt and I will get you to where you need to be when the time comes. Yeah, I um, I, I was on the phone with our good friend, Billy Goldfeder this week uh, over, the, over the same thing because he's getting inundated as well. And uh, it took me back, and I told Billy this, it took me back to um, when I was at the NFPA uh, and, uh, and I worked there from 2008 to 2010. Um, and the division that I managed was, um, the public fire protection division that was responsible for NFPA 1500 and 1580, all, all the, NF, all the These standards, standards huh? fire service. Okay. And one of the, one of the guys that uh, was really one of my key guys, Carl Peterson had been at the NFPA for 40 something years. Um, he said, you got to take a look at this file. And it was the NFPA 1500, initial NFPA 1500 file back in 1985, 86, 87, when uh, NFPA first enacted uh, NFPA 1500. And there, there was threatening letters. There was panicked letters. There were people running around like the hair was on fire. Babies will die in their cribs if the NFPA adopts NFPA 1500 and that this is, there's no fire department in the country that can comply with it and all. And all you're going to do is go back and look at the, the 1987 edition of 1500, which I would say 99% of fire departments now comply with. Um, it was sort of precedent setting when it first came in. It was scary. Uh, but at the end of the day, now we're pretty much doing all the things. All of us are doing pretty much all the things that uh, the uh, 1987, what was that, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever, 40 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, required. So uh, again, I, I echo that. Don't. There's no need to panic. Um, if you got a gripe, don't send emails to me. I'm tired of people sending gripes to me. I, I'm not going to do a thing. You know, right. you need to write to OSHA. <laughs> if you don't like something, write to OSHA. And, uh, you know, that's how uh, change is going to be effectuated. But, um, you, you know, just don't panic. Right. No I, you know, and there are certain people that should be concerned. Like it's interesting one, and we could do this for hours, so I won't, but you know, there's some interesting lines in their, in their initial comments. For example, one of the lines, they talk about the two in, two out rule. And mm -hmm. they're saying they recognize finally, as I've been preaching about forever, as everybody on the, you know, listening knows when you put water on a fire, what happens? Your visibility is gone. So two in, two out rule requires that you be in visual or voice communication. And they've mm -hmm. said voice is not over the radio, voice is in person. So mm -hmm. it's close proximity, which is a real issue. Um, I, I still, I disagree. It, it's no, that's, still- That's for the two, just saying, that's for the two in. The two it, in right. have to be, right? They can't be separate. But the two in and the two out can be in radio communication. And that is per NFPA. That's, a, right. that's right. Which they're mostly copying. But right. one of the things they said is they recognize that there's no visual anymore. And right. that voice is the only way. And they do say, right, they they also say in a later section that 
portable radios should be with every crew leader, if not with every person. So that's fine. So right, the two in can call the two out. But here's what they did. OSHA, with, that, with or without requiring it, just said no deaf firefighters. I, I mean, I think there's some very subtle things, but how wow. can you, and I've said this before too, if you can't see in the fire and it's either visual or voice and you can't hear and you certainly can't well, read lips. Physical, you got to see, you got to stay in physical contact then. Well, except yeah. how, how are you communicating at all? If they say voice or visual. And the way I look at it is, I don't know whether they intended it, but they just said no deaf firefighters. Now, I, I'm not saying there should or shouldn't be. I, right, right. Yeah, no, I get you. I get that, you. That's not my I, line. I, I but... think one of the things that I don't want to leave anybody kind of kind of wonder what we're talking about here. Yeah. The two in team has to remain physically close together. Right. OK, they have to remain a physical voice or uh, signal line communication. Uh, the two out can communicate over the radio and. Believe it or not, that is not permitted by OSHA. OSHA says you have to be in visual voice or, or signal line communication. NFPA will allow radio communication between the two in and the two out team. But OSHA so you, is going to be the law. Well, it is, but they're got, probably what they've done up to this point is they have deferred to the NFPA. Just like, you know, uh, the OSHA, OSHA's respiratory protection standard historically uh applied to general industry uh but they would say the nfpa just like you know for mining the you know msa uh there's there's all sorts of different specialty in petroleum industry and in the uh utilities industry they have standards and they will defer to industry specific safety standards and this is one of them now you raise a good point uh that may be something that osha needs to clarify uh, so why don't you send in a uh, send in a, uh, a I, I look and now that they've extended till June and then we'll get off this, which is supposed to be a two second little topic. But yeah, I, no. I, <laughs> I, I am trying to get myself as somebody who represents 500 departments to send in saying, here's what I'm seeing, because a lot of the questions they asked, I believe I can speak for a very wide range of entities. I do yeah. not agree. And this will be my last comment. It, it only mirrors yours, but I do not agree with all these entities. The fire district associations in New York, at least, are saying, no, horrible thing. I remember this. Just like you remember at 1500, I remember when we went from the basic interior course, which was a 40-hour essentials course, to be a... It was only for exterior, but that's what we use for interior. Nobody did the IFA part. Um, but... Everyone, when we went to 1001, oh, now we're going to have a, you know, a, an end where the firefighter one class modeling the 1001 NFPA, where no one's going to take it. And I was one of those people as a young, dumb attorney. I was like, oh my God, this is going to ruin the fire service. Safety standards are going to kill us. Well, they haven't killed cars, they haven't stopped airplanes. Right. They haven't stopped anything that OSHA covers, which is pretty much everything. Right. They, they haven't stopped any of that. And by the way, you can't get in a firefighter one course because there's so many people signed up for them. Yes, they're longer. Maybe there's fewer of them, but it hasn't stopped anyone from taking firefighter one. So relax. <laughs> it's just this too shall become just routine, right? Mm -hmm. And I believe, as Kurt believes, safety standards are better for all of us. Um, and OSHA's doing something and I, and I guess my last comment, OSHA is doing something they're asking. They're asking for your information. If you don't give them your information, shame on you. So write in. Every fire department should say, here are the questions they asked on the first 40 pages. And they're very clear. They're not hard to find. You read it and they say, we want to know. It's not hard. Well, tell them. If you don't tell them and you're like, oh, you got it wrong, that's on you. So tell them. They're asking for public's information. Give them the information. Okie does. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> That's um, you know, this one could either be really quick or not. Make it so really quick. <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna go to Georgia and look. They just said there's a Georgia case. Somebody filed um, and and there's state court. There's a federal court system. Generally, cases in a state court system are talking about state law issues. They also things like personal injury, et cetera. And it's a state defendant. It's not the federal government usually, uh, or it's not crossing state lines. The problem in the fire service is we cross state lines in theory. We're part of interstate commerce. We deal with trucks. So we could file a lot of things in federal court. But the rule, the question here that came up, very simple, is 
Is there a question of federal law that is contained in the lawsuit, the complaint, that should be handled by a federal court? Or are there no primary questions of federal law or statutes at issue that could be handled in a state court? And the court here said, listen, plaintiff, you filed in a federal or you filed your complaint. It is so replete with allegations of federal law, Fair Labor Standards Act, Title VII, all sorts of federal discrimination. They said, I love the line. I'm just so here's what they do. And I'm going to give you their one line holding, which I loved or one of the lines they're holding there. They said, we're keeping this in federal court. We're not going to move this to state court. We're uh, we're keeping this in federal court. It's not going back to state court. And what they said is 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 really one of my all time favorite lines, uh, which is the court has never seen a represented party contest removal after so clearly relying on federal law. Right. So the plaintiff makes so many complaints of you violated federal law, but we want to handle it in state court. Not going to happen. The federal court's keeping it. Um. So that's that's what the whole case was. Okay. Um, next case, uh, I've heard of this case. <laughs> next case, we have a lawsuit which was filed by me, um, ac actually. Um, but it, it's an interesting case because it piggybacked on something a week or two ago that we covered in last Wisconsin. Week. Yeah, I think it was last week. Yeah. Last week. Yeah. Um, time flies. So yeah. look, I'll, I'll try to be somewhat neutral uh, here, but the facts are that um, in New York State, in order to remove or suspend somebody as an officer or a member, you have to give them due process. And the statute in New York State, like many other state statutes, and um, say, here's what due process is. It's a hearing. It's a notice of a hearing. It's the right to receive the charges and be told what you did, what you violated. And here, the chief of the Waiting River Fire Department, which is at the long, far end of uh, Long Island, Suffolk County, was just kicked out. No due process. Nothing. So it was just, you're gone. We voted, you're out. So you can't do that in New York State. You can't do that a lot of places. Um, one interesting issue is, yes, there every the courts here are clear, at least in New York, that you have a property interest in being a member, a volunteer member of the fire department. He's a volunteer chief. Um, the question I had initially and found some cases, but the Wisconsin case we covered last week was great, says if there's a statute which grants you a right, it's a property interest. And here they have the right not to be removed, but for certain causes under a certain process. And I said they they haven't done that. The issue, the interesting part of this case will not be, however, that issue. It, it, we we shouldn't it should not be possible for any lawyer to lose the case on that. The harder part is twofold. The harder part in, in these volunteer cases generally is to recover the attorney's fees. These are expensive. So when we make a claim under 1983, you violate our due process rights and you have a history of doing this or et cetera, um, we're trying to get money for the attorney. And there's a great court case, which I will cite later in this case, but have cited in other pending cases, which are just like this. It says there's a court that says, you know, if you don't start granting attorneys their fees, even if the volunteer hasn't suffered monetary loss, there will be no ability to defend our due process rights because the attorneys won't handle them. Um, these lawsuits take 20 or thirty thousand dollars of attorney fees and times uh, mm -hmm. to to represent, to prosecute fully. And if the courts don't start saying, well, okay, but he's a volunteer, you get a dollar and you don't get attorney's fees. We've got a real issue. No, right. So then we're just setting sail on just abuse anybody's rights because they won't be able to afford it. It's a no attorney's fees under article 78. Article 78. Um, generally, no, you can ask. They're rarely given 1983 is your better option. Um, and if they're found to have violated 209 L, I argue your ninth award under 1983 has to be automatic, right? right? Because you won. They violated your due process rights. You won. You should recover attorney's fees. It's not automatic under an Article 78. And in fact, it's rarely given. Mm -hmm. um, attorney's fees and sanctions are rarely given. Um, so, but this is interesting. I I have another one just like this, exactly like this. And we're waiting a year. It's been more than a year for a decision. I mean, it's courts are inundated, especially down there. Um, but uh, anyway, it's an interesting issue. But I, I think the interesting issue is not the due process violation. That's a, you know, Sorry, that's no. a given. But yeah. get 
you know, we got to get something for people who had their rights violated. OK, yeah, there's also going to be some uh, incentive for them not to uh, do this again. And right. if they if, uh, you know, an award of one dollar is not really going to it's not really going to do it. It's a slap on the face. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's really a slap and slap in your face. And it I think it it hurts. Um, it hurt. It, it hurts the protection of people's rights and impairs the people's rights. Why? Why wouldn't you violate someone's rights if the only, you know, harm is, OK, you get a dollar. Yeah. Here you go. I'll pay you in advance. You know, I, I just I, I don't know. I, I hope the courts get it right here. I really do. Um, but it, it, it's, it's this case in my new case I was moving chairs here, this case in my new case, um, this case, I'm sorry, this case in a prior case, it's not that they're the first cases where there's absolutely nothing done. I win on those all the time, but they, it, it, it's really for the purpose of getting attorney's fees is that we, we need to stop this practice of just violating people's rights. And so this will be very novel, as will another case, to see what the courts do. Um, anyway, okay. So, uh, and then lastly, um, you put one up. It's uh, I, I was going to refer to it as a bump in the road. I didn't understand how this happened, but we have a there's a chief who was, I guess, at a shooting in Georgia, um, the state of, and he uh, someone was shot and killed, deceased, and the. Fire chief, I don't know whether he was escaping or what, but ran over the deceased individual. However, that happened. I'm I, in my mind as I read the recant and watch the video. Like, is there people running everywhere, and he just runs over someone? I couldn't tell. Could you? It's it's not it's not clear. And there's also an indication, at least at one point, that the chief had assessed him previously and determined that he was deceased, and then. So if he's and then drove over. There's no, I don't think there's any question. There's no question the gentleman was dead when the chief ran over him. That's what I thought was interesting about the suit. It is. The suit is not alleging wrongful death. They're not saying you killed our- It's desecration of a member. body, isn't it? It's desecration of a body, really. It's emotional harm to the family members knowing that their body, the their family member's body was not only run over, but also apparently it was dragged about 50 feet. Oh, God. And, um, and normally- but for another case I'm going to talk about, um, but I, normally I would say this lawsuit doesn't really have any, it's like a dollar. Okay, you did something wrong. Maybe, maybe, let's assume a jury or judge says, okay, you shouldn't have driven over them, whatever, but what's the harm? And remember we had that EMS suit, because I brought it up, I'm going to bring it up at one of uh, your and my lectures coming up this week, my conference, um, where the EMTs were scoping and practicing on a dead body yeah, at up, their up firehouse. John Murphy's wood, the woods up there, up in uh, uh, Washington State, yeah. Yeah, it, it was a little weird, but they were intubating a dead body who apparently they store at the firehouse I, during regular things, I, I oh, big refrigerator or something. In any event, that, and they paid. They, I think either, I think they voluntarily paid, I forget, but yeah. they paid money because desecrated a body. Well, intubate or whatever they did with the body, but intubating is nothing like running them over with a four wheel drive car. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, anyway, that'll, that's, that's, will be interesting. I, I, I yeah, it will be interesting, you know, hopefully it gets settled here, but um, just, just kind of a, you know, kind of one of those, uh, unusual types of cases. But uh, in, in this case, I, I don't know if you remember going back to law school, um, the, the issue of, of recovery, not for damages, not for monetary damages or physical damages to yourself, but emotional harm. Yeah, but you got to be in the zone of interest. They weren't anywhere well, near there, right? Um, unless unless it's a, a close family member. There is that exception for close family members. So uh, again, it'll be interesting. I think there's a lot of ifs uh, in, the, in the case. I mean, what happens should not have happen all right so right. you know that's but just because something bad happened doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be a way to recover for it but we'll see they, they right. weren't you're right they were not in the zone of harm but it was a family member you know so we'll we'll see and there's precedent at least in the you know intubation case and yeah, different state. It, i think it's, um, i think it's the exact same issue you know yeah, yeah. be very interesting anyway happy right, April well, fools everyone yeah, well, that's going to do it for another edition of File Law Roundup. Uh, toward the end of this week, we're going to be up in uh, Syracuse or up in Verona. Verona, uh, Nida County, Central uh, New York. We'll be up at the uh, Churning Stone Resort for Brad's conference. So looking forward to getting out uh, for that. So Yeah, I can't wait right. to see you. All right. All right. And we'll see everyone next week. 